Yes, I'll be telling you the good and bad of entrepreneurship. Because we're a public company, I just got to show this slide in case I make any forward-looking <laughs> forward statements. <laughs> yeah, don't laugh, but it's, I, have to, I have to put it up there um, in case I make any forward-looking statements um, and you decide to buy stock based on what I say. So there's a conversation going on around food. And how are we going to produce more food on less land and do it more sustainably? And it can be a very contentious conversation or a debate about whether it's going to be organic that's going to save the world or it's going to be GMOs. Well, let me tell you, it's going to be innovation and entrepreneurship and startups. There is an explosion of startups in ag and ag and food right now, and there's an explosion of investors investing in ag and food from farm to fork. So improved seeds to inputs that would be biological products that increase plant production and yields and also control pests, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, precision farming, big data, uh, characterizing the, the, what, what affects yields on your farm, robotics. There's a spin out from Stanford that has a robotic weed picker. So it goes along the, the row and picks out the weeds. It has a vision system to do that. Um, and also interesting plant-based proteins or even proteins from insects, so novel foods. And, it venture, and venture capitalists and investors have been getting some money from exits. So that's, of course, been attractive to have new money come in. My sector is pesticides and crop production. $55 billion worth of chemical pesticides are deployed globally every year. About two and a half billion of biological products, which are the ones that we make, are deployed every year. But our sector is growing at double digits, whereas chemicals are on the decline. Why is that? Because if you are a Napa Valley, where I, I live 50 minutes away from Napa Valley, and if you're a Napa Valley wine grape grower, and you spray in the morning for powdery mildew, and you want to be back in the field with your work crew to prune, you can do that with our products because they're safer because you have a shorter worker reentry. Also, the insect pests do not develop resistance to our products. So you can incorporate our products into a pest management program and delay the development of resistance. And our products give higher yields and quality than chemical only programs, and they help the food channel meet sustainability metrics um, that are being imposed upon farmers. So all these reasons is why our sector is growing very fast. Well, how did I get into this? I'm an entomologist. I'm an undergraduate, bachelor's of, of science from CALS, and it was because I grew up on this beautiful mini farm in southern Connecticut. And my mother just turned 90 last week, and I actually fly all the way from California and do her garden for her now, which is about a half an acre, and I planted awesome leafy greens and tomatoes, if I say so myself. And I even outwitted the critters this year. And uh, I still go swimming with the bass in the uh, two-acre bass fishing and swimming pond that we built when I was seven. And when I was young, I would take a, a kitchen strainer, I'd screen along the, the edge, and I would identify all the insects in there. But what really got me into this, and yes, I wanted to be an entomologist since I was seven years old. So this is a life mission here, life vision and mission. Well, there's this dogwood tree. That's a recent picture. And it was much smaller right outside of the kitchen window from the house my father built. And every year, that, or every few years, the gypsy moths, the caterpillars up here, would come in and wipe out the trees. And they looked like skeletons. And I could stand out in the woods, and it would be raining frass, which is the technical term for insect poop. Now, um, my father didn't want to lose this dogwood tree. So he went to the store, and he got a chemical pesticide, and he sprayed it. And my mother starts screeching, and, and she finds into, within 24 hours, all the lady beetles, lacewings, honeybees were dead under the tree. And she said, you will never use a chemical again. So my father went to the store, and he actually found a biological pesticide, the first one ever commercialized, called BT, from a soil microorganism, Bacillus thuringiensis, that when the, the caterpillar ingests it, it gives them a stomach ache, and they die. And so he sprayed it, and I said, Dad, how'd it work? And he goes, well, it's good for the environment. It makes your mother happy, but I don't know if it really worked. Well, that is the story of my career. I have wanted to create products that actually do work and provide value for farmers, but there's a tremendous amount of skepticism about this technology that is now changing because our techno this technology is now coming to the tipping point. 
So what do we do? We actually do go to the rainforest hunting for microorganisms and extracts of plants that we can turn into products, just like penicillin comes from a mold or your antibiotics come from microorganisms and uh, a heart drug comes from digitalis, a plant. We do the same and we look for areas of high biodiversity and bring those samples back to the laboratory. The scientists look for the microorganisms and the extracts of the plants, and then through a very scientific process, we identify the compounds causing the pesticidal activity, and we ferment them or extract them from plants, and uh, then we, ma we manufacture them in our plant in Michigan and turn them into products. And they look just like the uh, chemical pesticides when the farmer applies them, but in the jug or in the bag is a microorganism and, a, and the mixture of compounds that it might make that's causing the pesticidal activity, or in one case of our regalia, it's an extract of giant knotweed that boosts the plant's immune system and increases yield and controls plant diseases like powdery mildew. So, I started the company in 2006, and it was going very well. And our investors are raised, uh, raised a bunch of money and from venture capitalists, and they said, well, you know, it might be start to time to thinking about going public. So we, uh, in April of 2011, we did our first investment banker bake-off, where we had investment bankers come in and say, you know, would they, what do they think about us doing an IPO? So then they told us a number of milestones that we needed to do, get a big corporate partner to validate our technology and some other things, which we then, you know, had a checklist of things we needed to do. So then uh, Congress passed the Jobs Act, Jumpstart Our Business Act, which was very good for small companies. So we could file our SEC document um, confidentially and no one would know, and then we could get comments back and get our act together to, confidentially to prepare for that IPO. So we, uh, they also, the Jobs Act allowed you to do a test the waters presentation to investors before the real thing. So you can actually pitch without, um, you know, just, just to a friendly group of potential investors and they would give you feedback about it in preparation for the real road show. So we did that, test the waters, so starting in 2011, now we're up to uh, 2013. And then uh, we, we did the, uh, and went uh, live with the first trade on August 2nd with the IPO. And uh, we had quite a number of investor meetings. It was grueling. Um, I got no sleep most of the time, but uh, I'm very sensitive to caffeine, so one tall latte, and I'm bing, 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 ready to go again without any problem. And uh, so it was a very uh, exhausting but thrilling time. And my mother, who just turned 90 last week, um, is by my side along with her younger sister. It was the happiest day of my career, going public and ringing the bell. But what can go wrong? It's not all so happy. So let me tell you the story of my, my uh, last company, AgriQuest, a startup that I did, a venture capital-backed startup. And if you look at the... The left side of this curve, it's a venture capitalist dream. So we started, I started the company in 95, and then I did a round of financing every year, and about, and then up to a filing with the SEC for our IPO at very heady valuation because we were right at the very, just the tail of the first tech boom where valuations, you could go out public with just very little revenue, or even if you were a tech company, no revenue. Well, I was, booked to fly to uh, the World Financial Center and to Merrill Lynch's offices um, in New York here. And our lawyers for the deal, well, their lawyers for the deal were in the South Tower. And my plane was September 12, 2001. And it just so happened, as you know, 9-11 happened. And so I, all planes were grounded and I couldn't go. And the market slammed shut and I couldn't get the IPO done. So then all of our investors on most of the um, members of the board of directors were also our venture capital backers, and they became very, it was very difficult, and they wanted to, um, didn't want to give out any more money. So they accepted terms from an, an investor um, in a cram down fashion. So any entrepreneurs in the room, you should learn what a cram down is. And, and uh, took terms for this deal with two and a half times liquidation preferences and uh, full ratchet anti-dilution. I'm not gonna explain what those are now, but look them up, you need to know those words. And so what happened was, our stock was $1.38, and the following round that the investor put in, he offered 6.7 cents. Because of the full ratchet, that meant that all previous rounds that were below 
the, or above the 6.7 cents, ratcheted down to that price, which meant that we had 30 million shares outstanding and had to issue 450 million new shares to those investors coming in in that round, which meant that my founder stock became extremely diluted and have to, going from owning 5% of the company down to 0.1%. Then I left the company in 2006 to start this one, and then uh, the same investors kept putting in money at very low prices, even 4.7 cents, so very diluted. So the company ended up with a billion shares. And because he had two and a half times liquidation preferences, m meaning when the company is sold, he gets his money out first at two and a half X times his original investment, that wiped out even more my founder stock. So in 2012, when it was a really good time and biological, uh, a lot of the big ag chem companies like Bayer and Monsanto and those had a lot of money and they were looking for things to buy. They bought my old company for almost 500 million and I got zero from founding it and working 10 years in the company and building all, all that value. So I said, hey, I'm a, I'm a resilient entrepreneur. Hey, that's, no, that's not a problem. I'll just make it up on the next one. No problem. Well, I'll tell you that story in a minute. But some lessons, raise money when you don't need it. Always take more money than you think you need. Don't worry so much about dilution. Windows open and close. You better move fast to raise money when a window is open for raising money. Well, fortunately for this company, I raised money right before the 2008 downturn, because that's when markets sh uh, slam shut, and uh, you just never know what's going to happen. As you know, we might have a terrorist attack. So, um, and then don't ever accept a full, don't ever, ever accept a full ratchet anti-dilution and watch out for multiple participating liquidation preferences. And do plan for disaster, because now you know what kinds of things can happen. Brexit, an unusual US election. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's really important to select your financial partners and board members very carefully, but I'll, I'll mention more about that in a minute. So, horror story number two is my current company. So we went public August 2013. Great, why would we go public? We're creating a new category. No one ever heard of biologicals. And I wanted to create a new category on Wall Street, not just chemical companies that were public, but a new category of biological product companies. So, and we could raise more money faster um, on, uh, than private rounds, and uh, so, so we could grow faster. Well, um, on, in August 2014, our COO, who was also head of sales, resigns, and several of his salespeople, in fact, almost the entire sales, sales force, resigned. So his resignation drove the stock down by 50%. I watched millions of shares being sold. I really, literally wept. But then, in September of 2014, one of our customers made us aware of a side deal um, which gave them inventory protection, which means the right to return some product. Now, why would, we, why would that be? Uh, why would we even have that deal? All of our customers certified, including that one, certified our sales as final. And the audit was final, and um, the auditors you know, finalized it. But there was a side deal between buddies from our, you know, our customers and my, my guy, COO. And so when we discovered that, it is the law, we had to turn that over to the audit committee of the board. And they did a, embarked on an independent investigation and hired Pricewaterhouse and Wilson Sonsini, I think, um, or Cooley Goddard, which one was it? What, Cooley, Wilson, I think. Um, you know, big name uh, firms to conduct the independent investigation. So this investigation went on a very long time. The SEC got involved and subpoenaed all of my devices um, and, uh, and, 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 and my per personal you know, Facebook accounts, everything, and looked through everything. And um, if you look at what happened to the stock, so it went down even more when we, we had to announce the accounting investigation. And then uh, because our stock was, was on the downward trend, we got removed from the Russell 2000 and it plummeted. And uh, then we filed our, fi our, after 15 months of grueling uh, uh, work where Ernst & Young was going through all of our financials to figure out how we we're gonna restate that, 5.7 million of the revenue between, in 13 and 14 would be deferred. They decided deferred to future periods because of the side deals that they had, real sales, but they just changed the accounting treatment so they had to be deferred. And two million of the 14 million of 2014 sales would be returned to customers. So it wasn't too bad in terms of customer returns because all the rest of the customers said, no, we really did want the product. But the accounting treatment of was it have to be referred, so uh, deferred. So when we announced our uh, financials in May of 
uh, it was actually, when we finally restated our financials, it was November of uh, 2015 of last year. And, the, and everyone was like, oh my God, it cost us 17 million in lawyer and um, accounting fees and, um, and a 1.75 million SEC fine because it happened on our company watch, so the company's liable. And I had to lay off half of my employees and we were 160 employees and we were down to 80. And I had uh, 80 in R&D and went down to, to, to 28. So it was a disaster. And uh, then of course our stock dropped so low they were a threat of being delisted by NASDAQ because we didn't meet listing qualifications so the stock dropped again. So you can see the, the timeline here. So, um, you know, I, I'm, well, me and my CFO were, you know, losing sleep. We're, it's really, really a difficult time. Things became, within the company, um, when a crisis like this happens, you find out, you know, who are the ones who are robust and who are the ones who run for the hills, who are the ones that have self-interest. My husband, who is a child therapist, also a Cornell undergraduate, human ecology. We met when we were here at Cornell, and uh, he, he named the errors of the company and I kind of like them. It's uh, the first part after we discovered the, the problems was the Lord of the Flies. Th then it was the Game of Thrones era. And now it's Fellowship of the Ring. So we've uh, restructured the company. And it is, it is actually most fun. Um, everyone's aligned. We've rebuilt our culture in a positive direction. And our financial performance, which is most important to investors, has improved. Three quarters of very high growth in a row. We have, we have our um, next, our third quarter um, earnings on November 14th. And um, haven't, so we have not, haven't announced that one yet, but three quarters in a row. And our margins have improved. Because we, um, the sales came to a screeching halt because um, most of the sales and marketing left. We, um, our, our sales were uh, flatlined, and we had a built up a lot of inventory, so our manufacturing plant was idle for a year, and so that was an overhang on the gross margins. So we got all the survivors together, and, and a lot of people left, and our comp competitors were brutal and, and kept hiring one after another of our R&D. But it turns out that was OK, because the ones who stayed really believed in this. So we rebuilt. Um, the, whole, the whole company and started with the mission and vision. And this is what keeps us all, all th kept us through this whole thing, kept myself through it, because we are changing the world with what we're doing. And we redid the values. So the, a, a number of, and you've heard um, talks about this today, about uh, values and culture and how important it is. And I cannot, you can just never underestimate this. A lot of people say it, but it's absolutely true that everyone in the company is aligned to your mission, your vision, and your values. So our uh, teams of employees put together these uh, values. And now what happens in, I don't even have to really get involved too much in hiring as much as I did in the past because the hiring, hiring team will come to me and they'll say, oh, great background, wonderful scientific background, great experience, doesn't fit our culture, forget it. And I go, okay. So hiring employees who fit the desired culture and are aligned with your vision, values, and strategy, it's easy to say but not easy to do. And we're t much, much more careful now in our hiring. We were in a very fast growth. So when you're in a fast growth phase, you hire quickly. You know, I'd really urge you uh, entrepreneurs in that fast growth phase to really take your time and really scrutinize every single person. Even one bench technician can make a big difference because you'll find that there's informal and formal leaders, not just your formal leaders or your supervisors, but there could be a top scientist or a top engineer who has a lot of influence and can move your culture into a, drift your culture into, into a direction you don't want it to do. And so what I found is, so I was required to take a lot of training as part of the mitigation for the fraud. By the way, I forgot to tell you that the former COO was arrested in February and charged with 16 counts of fraud, um, and he's awaiting trial. So um, what I found out was that it takes constant attention by the CEO to make sure that you don't have this cultural and values drift. And it takes a lot more attention than you realize. And uh, so you've got, and, and this kind of, um, ours is a, you know, our, we had a, a big, this is big for our company, but there's, there's a lot, there's VW, there's Wells Fargo, there's huge companies that are, are in the news for um, uh, fraud and other things. And so, um, and what I found out from my trainer from Price Waterhouse, 
um, who's head of fraud for the Western Division, is how common this kind of bad behavior is. So how do you address this? Because the financial, fraud, the financial controls would not have caught it, and I don't need to get into the detail, would not have caught our situation. Um, and so they weren't designed for that kind of fraud. So it has to do with culture. And uh, you really have to focus on it. And I just can't underestimate uh, that. So what kept me going? Well, this. Being at the growers, this is a, uh, I was visiting some strawberry growers in California. And there were, one grower had three different types of production systems. He had organic, which is very fast growing, a lot of demand for organic production. And then he had, where they used chemicals early in the season, but then they had to stop spraying because the buyers of strawberries that are air shipped to Korea and Japan and Europe did not want chemical, the buyers would be the supermarket retailers, did not want the chemical residues on the strawberries. So they would stop spraying and then use our products to control the pests near harvest. Or the conventional grower who was still using chemicals but would add our product to the tank and get better control of the bug with ours in there. This is why I keep going because we are changing how agriculture and food is produced. And what I have is a dream, and I, will, I, I think it's in my lifetime, um, that we, instead of a chemical intensive ag production, we have an ecologically based sustainable ag production that's the basis for ag production. And then you only dial in the chemicals when you need it. And the types of products that we're developing at our company, I really believe, are, are going to be transformative in this uh, trend to sustainable production. So thank you very much. Thank you.